Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about peace and how to get it. And I don't mean just in your heart or your home or your town, though those would be very nice. I mean in the world, including in Ukraine. Uh, and I'm not going to have any guests on the show this week. I'm instead going to tell you what I said at a peace conference this past weekend in New York State called the Kateri Peace Conference, K-A-T-E-R-I, kateripeaceconference.org. I'm hoping that all the videos and transcripts of all the speakers from that event will show up at that website because I learned a great deal from uh, some incredible people, Kathy Kelly, Gloria Caballero Roca, Nick Mottern, and Deborah Sweet. But let me tell you what I said for my bit. Uh, I spoke on the first day largely as a sort of insider, advice to those who are active in the peace movement already, what we should be doing. And on the second day, more on the topic of how we need to talk to people who don't get it or don't have the time to get it or aren't involved for whatever reason. So let me tell you what both of those sets of remarks consisted of. Uh, and I would love feedback from you all through talkworldradio.org on what you think of it. I think I'm preaching largely to the choir here, I said. As we know from the song by Emma's Revolution, it can be enjoyable to do that. But I actually prefer trying to persuade the unconverted. Just look around. There are millions of people dramatically unconverted. Activism is mocked. There are real estate construction booms in places guaranteed to go underwater or become uninhabitably hot. Two governments with most of the nuclear weapons on Earth are locked in a war that can end only through nuclear apocalypse or compromise, and both have declared compromise to be heresy. Residents of the country that principally drives the world's war business dine on the dead flesh of the world-killing livestock industry in air-conditioned funhouses watching television broadcasts explain how a government that sets new records for the unpopularity of its political candidates every four years and polls below used car dealers for trustworthiness must coat the planet with weapons in the name of democracy including weapons that will deform infants, blow the arms and legs off children, and poison soil for centuries to come, including weapons that never make it to the destination used to justify them but end up killing elsewhere, even while that same government sabotages peace talks and deports Russians who fled the war because upholding the sanctity of the military draft is even more important than crushing Russia. And your average person appears intent on changing as few behaviors as possible. Outdoor exercising can get moved to the middle of the night. Burning man can switch from the name of an event to the name of a species. But lifting a finger to protest nuclear weapons? That would be crazy. Isn't watching a movie about it enough? And what about us in the choir? Are we also intent on changing as few behaviors as possible? I don't think we should change for its own sake or blame ourselves for the misdeeds of others, but we should change when we see a more strategic path to peace. If I saw three people drowning and two people sitting on a bench watching, I wouldn't ask any questions, but immediately scream, get up and let's help. Yet when I see the whole world's ecosystems collapsing and governments racing toward nuclear apocalypse and I see two people sitting on a bench, I'm more inclined to walk up to them mumbling, excuse me, I'm really sorry to disturb you, but I'm conducting a survey for the Chamber of Commerce to raise funds for stranded kittens in Ukraine. And may I ask if it's not too much trouble, have you ever heard of nuclear winter? Now, I think we need something in between those two extremes of screaming at people and treating people like they're delicate china. We need to sympathize with people, assume the best of people, recognize that almost everybody put together are not doing the damage that a very few billionaires are doing, recognize that people are sometimes overworked, overstressed, and underinformed. Be aware that people only arrive or stay in office in Washington, D.C. 
through developing horrible habits that can be hard for them to break. But at the same time, be honest with people. It's not fair to them or ourselves or the generations that might or might not be to come for us not to tell them, not to speak when we are aware of crimes being committed, crimes that can only be reported to an authority higher than a government, namely the people. I think we need to focus ever more on our efforts against war, on the issues of nuclear threat and environmental destruction. If nuclear weapons continue to exist, there will very likely be a nuclear catastrophe, and the more the weapons have proliferated, the sooner it will come. Hundreds of incidents have nearly destroyed our world through accident, confusion, misunderstanding, and extremely irrational machismo. When you add in the quite real and increasing possibility of non-state terrorists acquiring and using nuclear weapons, the danger grows dramatically and is only increased by the policies of nuclear states that react to terrorism in ways that seem designed to recruit more terrorists. We should celebrate Vasily Arkhipov with the presumably easy lesson being that we shouldn't count on always having a Russian sailor to save us. War and preparations for war are not just the pit into which trillions of dollars that could be used to prevent environmental damage are dumped, but also a major direct cause of that environmental damage. Global militarism produces roughly twice the greenhouse gases as non-military aviation. And if it were a country, it would rank fourth in greenhouse gas emissions. The U.S. military's greenhouse gas emissions are more than those of most entire countries. To the damage of military's pollution should be added that of the weapons manufacturers, as well as the enormous destruction of wars, the oil spills, oil fires, methane leaks, etc. In militarism, we are talking about a top destroyer of land and water and air and ecosystems, as well as climate, as well as the chief impediment to global cooperation on climate, as well as the primary sinkhole for funds that could be going into climate protection. Well over half of U.S. tax dollars, for example, go to militarism. We also need to adjust to the partisan situation in the United States, where CNN says the majority oppose more weapons to Ukraine, but many peace groups are wary of catching up to that majority. The problem is that we're more familiar with having millions of people oppose a war because the president is a Republican. We don't know what to do with people who oppose a war because the president is a Democrat, or because they want a war with China, or because they've just discovered that wars cost money, or because they support Russian war making, or because Tucker Carlson told them to. How do we collaborate without accepting horrible views as part of the package? How do we work for peace while shunning fascistic and right-wing notions that make peace impossible? We also need to adjust to the propaganda around Ukraine. How do we help well-meaning people understand that keeping an endless war going is not helping anyone, quite the reverse? How can we build on newfound awareness that wars cost money and have victims? How can we build on the tendency of the U.S. public to get tired of mass slaughters after about 18 months? We also need to adjust the language we use, and I recommend the new guide to talking about war that's found at wordsaboutwar.org. We also need to adjust to the coming pandemic known as a U.S. election year. We have to figure out how to do events for peace that are not painted as rallies for one side of a war or for one political candidate. Neither one of the hopeless ones nor one of the two actually allowed to compete. Can we use the and abuse election events to communicate? And can we at the same time stop the election from eating up quite all of our energy and funding? World Beyond War recently gave out our third annual War Abolisher Awards to standout activists. Perhaps putting human faces on activism can give it some of the allure of elections. We also have to recognize which of our activities simply need to be increased and which abandoned. I think a great deal, not all, of what we lobby for in Washington, D.C. is a complete waste of time. 
at best assisting certain Congress members in scamming us and themselves into believing they're trying. I think most protests and rallies and teach-ins and media production and local organization building and global solidarity efforts need primarily to be expanded. World Beyond War has hired organizers in Canada and Latin America and is searching for the funding to hire them across the globe because we are stronger as a global movement. As much as any other town in the U.S., my town, Charlottesville, Virginia, has failed in recent years when it comes to opposing wars. We used to be a leader, passing early resolutions through our city council, inspiring others to advocate against wars in Iraq or Iran, against armed drones, telling Congress to move funding to human and environmental needs, divesting public dollars from weapons companies, ridding local police of weapons of war, etc. Peace rallies were not rare occurrences. At long last, we now have an event planned to advocate and strategize for peace in Ukraine, one that will be live-streamed for the world to see at civilukraine.org. Many towns are ahead of mine, but many more have yet to get started. Let's help them. So those were my remarks on the first day of the conference. This is David Swanson at talkworldradio.org talking about a recent peace conference in New York State called the Kateri Peace Conference. I again wish you could hear the remarks uh, of all the other speakers who were there and the discussion that followed and encourage you to contact me and to visit the website of worldbeyondwar.org uh, to engage in an ongoing discussion uh, of what can be done to make peace happen. Uh, I want to also tell you what I said on the second day of this conference uh, and again wish you could uh, have been there and could see or read the remarks of all of the other speakers but these were mine. 200 years ago this coming December a local boy from my town gave a speech. In the years that followed pundits and politicians took an excerpt of that speech, carved it in marble, lit it with eternal white phosphorus bombs, and prayed to it before every shareholder's meeting. They named it the Monroe Doctrine. It created the model used ever more frequently up to this day of picking out the worst thing a U.S. president has said and declaring it to be their doctrine. There's nothing in U.S. law about the presidential power to create doctrines, much less the power of newspaper columnists to do so. But here we are. Almost everyone accepts doctrines. Almost everyone pretends that the half of the Monroe Doctrine about the U.S. staying out of wars in Europe never happened. Half of the U.S. political establishment proudly promotes the Monroe Doctrine, meaning subjugation of Latin America and by extension the rest of the world. The other half does the exact same thing but less proudly and while declaring themselves opposed to the Monroe Doctrine. The notion that the United States can arrogantly dominate the rest of the Western Hemisphere long preceded its ability to do so and was followed up, including in subsequent presidential doctrines, with the notion that the rest of the world was next. The U.S. and its NATO sidekicks now treat Africa similarly and with similar results. How do these countries that manufacture no weapons or military trainers manage so many well-armed and well-trained coups? It's not even a mystery in U.S. discourse. It's just understood as a reflection on the backward cultures of Africa, which itself says something about the backwardness of a culture, but it isn't a culture in Africa. Also 200 years ago this year, President James Monroe's buddy, Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall, put the doctrine of discovery into U.S. law. The doctrine that the U.S. government, as a replacement for European governments, could steal any non-European land it wanted. Monroe was the leading militarist and warmonger of his day, but probably wouldn't have been needed had someone else been president. The people who developed the Monroe Doctrine justified imperialism to themselves with the following ideas. One, we are opposing European imperialism, so we can't be doing imperialism. Two, anybody who had the chance would want to be part of the United States, so we're not forcing anything on anyone. Three, 
These people are subhuman animals or ignorant heathen who don't know that they want to be part of the United States. So we have to show them. And finally, four. What people? These lands are basically empty. The story of U.S. conduct in New York State during Monroe's presidency of 1817 to 1825 probably lacks no outrage ever committed in Central America under the banner of the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe himself in 1784 had been the first member of the Congress of the Confederation to go west when he took a tour of New York State and Pennsylvania to explore the edges of the empire. When Monroe was president, nations of people who had assisted the United States in its revolution were forced to give up their land by their great father, President Monroe, in the interests of profitable corporations like the Ogden Land Company, facilitated by modern transportation improvements like the Erie Canal built between 1817 and 1825. In Ohio, the U.S. bribed chiefs to sell lands. In Indiana, native nations were forced out west of the Mississippi. Treating the doctrine of discovery as law meant that Monroe and his bloodthirsty subordinate, Andrew Jackson, could take land from people who could be said not to legally possess it. Marshall, later, in 1831, would rule against the Cherokee Nation citing the use of phrases like great father to claim that indigenous nations were related to the U.S. government as a ward is to his guardian. In his fateful speech, President Monroe denounced Russian efforts to claim non-U.S. territories as an outrage against good Republican governments and a threat to spread bad systems of government. It would eventually become the manifest destiny of the United States to take over much of North America, in part to keep Russia out of it. If any of this sounds familiar, or if you're struck by how powerful and successful Russiagate and Ukraine war propaganda have been, it's because the tradition is long, broken principally by that moment when the Soviets defeated the Nazis, which we've all been conditioned to pretend never happened. This background can help explain why it has taken so long to see peace activism in the United States grow in opposition to the war in Ukraine. From a certain perspective, it's very strange that it's taken so long. Nothing in my lifetime has done more to increase the risk of nuclear apocalypse than the war in Ukraine. Nothing is doing more to impede global cooperation on climate, poverty, or homelessness. Few things are doing as much direct damage in those areas, devastating the environment, disrupting grain shipments, creating millions of refugees, while death and injury counts in Iraq were heatedly disputed in U.S. media for years. There's widespread acceptance that deaths and injuries in Ukraine are already near half a million. There's no way to precisely count how many lives could have been saved around the world, by investing hundreds of billions in something wiser than this war. But a fraction of that could end starvation on Earth. Last week in the New York Times, we read about villagers in Ukraine whose plows turn up weaponry in their fields from both the current war and still to this day from World War II. While Russians blowing things up and killing people is supposed to be understood as horrible or noble, depending which of those two wars it's part of. The poisons and dangers left in the fields look about the same to the people who live there. Both sides of the current war are adding cluster bombs to the mix, and at least the U.S. side is adding depleted uranium. From another perspective, it's clear why there has been so much acceptance of this war. It's U.S. weapons, not U.S. lives. It's a war against a country demonized in U.S. media for decades and centuries, for its actual crimes and for fictions, like imposing Donald Trump on us. I can understand not wanting to admit that we did that to ourselves. It's a war against a Russian invasion of a smaller country. If you're going to protest U.S. invasions, why not protest a Russian invasion? Indeed. But a war is not a protest. It's mass slaughter and destruction. 
Manipulating good intentions is part of the standard package, and it's our job to help people see through that. Destroying Iraq was marketed in the United States as for the benefit of the Iraqis. The most obviously provoked war in recent years in Ukraine was christened the Unprovoked War. U.S. and other Western diplomats, spies, and theorists predicted for 30 years that breaking a promise and expanding NATO would lead to war with Russia. President Barack Obama refused to arm Ukraine, predicting that doing so would lead toward where we are now, as Obama still saw it in April 2022. Prior to the unprovoked war, there were public comments by U.S. officials arguing that the provocations would not provoke anything. Well, I don't buy this argument that, you know, us supplying the Ukrainians with defensive weapons is going to provoke Putin said Senator Chris Murphy, Democrat of Connecticut. One can still read a RAND report advocating creating a war like this one through the sorts of provocations that senators claimed wouldn't provoke anything. And among thousands of other examples with which I could continue this list, this past week, the head of NATO openly bragged about how NATO had provoked this war as part of bragging about how this war had benefited NATO. But what can be done? Provoked or not, you have a horrendous, murderous criminal invasion. Now what? Well, now you have endless stalemate with years of killing or nuclear war. You want to do what you can to help Ukraine, but the millions of Ukrainians who have fled and those who have stayed to face prosecution for peace activism look wiser each day. The question is whether keeping a war going is more helpful to Ukrainians or the rest of the world than ending it with a compromise aimed at a sustainable peace. According to Ukrainian media and foreign affairs and Bloomberg and Israeli, German, Turkish, and French officials, the U.S. pressured Ukraine to prevent a peace agreement in the early days of the invasion. Since then, the U.S. and allies have provided mountains of free weapons to keep the war going. Eastern European governments have expressed concern that if the U.S. slows or ends the weapons flow, Ukraine might become willing to negotiate peace. Peace is viewed by some on both sides of the war, many of them quite far removed from the fighting, not as a good thing, but as even worse than ongoing slaughter and devastation. Both sides insist on total victory, but that total victory is nowhere in sight as other voices on both sides quietly admit, and any such victory would not be lasting as the defeated side would plot vengeance as soon as possible. Yet both sides persist in declaring victory imminent. Yesterday, the New York Times wrote, quote, the images of Russian troops retreating from a village in Ukraine under fire leave little doubt of the impact of cluster munitions. You're supposed to read that and obediently have little doubt, even if you're pretty sure that videos exist of soldiers retreating under fire from non-cluster munitions. Compromise is a difficult skill. We teach it to toddlers, but not to governments. Traditionally, a refusal to compromise, even if it kills us, has more appeal on the political right. But political party means everything in U.S. politics, and the president is a Democrat. So what is a liberal thinking person to do? We have to encourage them to think a bit more or differently. Nearly two years of peace proposals from around the globe almost all include the same elements. Removal of all foreign troops, neutrality for Ukraine, autonomy for Crimea and Donbass, demilitarization, and lifting sanctions. This is a consensus view of expert observers. Should we pay attention? At this point, some observable action must precede negotiations because trust is non-existent. Either side could announce a ceasefire and ask that it be matched. Either side could announce a willingness to agree to a particular agreement, including the elements above. If a ceasefire is not matched, the slaughter can be quickly resumed. If a ceasefire is used to build up troops and weapons for the next battle, 
Well, then, the sky is also blue and a bear does it in the woods. Nobody imagines either side as capable of switching off the war business that quickly. A ceasefire is required for negotiations, and an end to weapons shipments is required for a ceasefire. So these three elements must come together. They could be abandoned together if negotiations fail, but why not try? Allowing the people of Crimea and Donbass to determine their own fate is the real sticking point for Ukraine. But that solution strikes me as at least as big a victory for democracy as sending more U.S. weapons to Ukraine despite the opposition of the majority of people in the United States. War is in fact the opposite of democracy and should never be waged in its name. New alliances like BRICS are not international law and will not save us from war, though it's possible they'll move things in that direction. But a globe with two or more nations or alliances enforcing Monroe doctrines would surely kill us all. Even just the one original Monroe doctrine might do that yet. So I encourage you to organize a local burial of the Monroe Doctrine on December the 2nd. 200 years is enough. Visit worldbeyondwar.org for our help and assistance and the list of other places doing the same thing. A local event makes a much bigger splash when it's one of a series of global events on the same day. I also encourage you to build a bigger movement over the coming months with events that take part in Code Pink's Summer of Peace, that mark the International Day of Peace on September the 21st, that include watch parties for World Beyond War's annual conference online September 22nd to 24th, that join in Diffuse Nuclear War's Week of Action September the 24th to 30th, and Campaign Nonviolence's Week weeks of action, September the 21st to October the 2nd, and that add to the global days of action for peace in Ukraine, September 30th to October 8th, and the Keep Space for Peace week, October 7th to 14th. We also need, of course, to mark Armistice Day, in some parts of the world, Remembrance Day, a day on November the 11th that's often misnamed Veterans Day. Uh, we need to celebrate Armistice Day as it was once celebrated. And I encourage everyone to learn about and spread the word about the upcoming Merchants of Death Tribunal, merchantsofdeath.org, November the 12th, 2023. Also, there are not just wars in Ukraine. There are wars, some of them worse than the war in Ukraine, ongoing around the world and I encourage you to join World Beyond Wars Africa conference online November the 23rd to 25th which you can find at worldbeyondwar.org if that's not enough to work on there is no limit just let me know get in touch through worldbeyondwar.org or davidswanson.org or talkworldradio.org thank you this is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.